Next is Monique Schwitter, one of our writers from Switzerland. Monique Schwitter was born in Zurich and now lives and works in Ham Hamburg. She studied acting and directing at the Mozarteum University of Dramatic Arts in Salzburg and went on to perform in Zurich, Frankfurt, and Graz. In 2005, she published her first volume of short stories, Wenn Schneit beim Krokodil, When It Snows at the Crocodile Pen, and uh, which won the Robert Walser Prize for Best Literary Debut of the Year. In 2008, she published her novel, Ohren haben keine Lieder, Ears Have No Lids. And in uh, 2011, she published the collection of stories, Goldfish <coughs> Gedächtnis, which we're featuring this year, Goldfish Memory. Uh, it's her second collection of stories. In 2013, she was awarded the Manuscripta Prize for her body of work. The stories in Goldfish Memory are about connections made and connections missed, and it's never entirely clear which are preferable. In one story, a man and a woman who know nothing more about each other than their names meet on the 13th of every month at a casino to gamble until midnight. The one time they try to meet outside of those parameters, their, run, their luck runs out. In another story, a father dresses as a skeleton for Halloween to please his young son, and even though the boy recognizes his father by his distinctive loud breathing, the son is nearly frightened to death, and so is the father. Other families in this collection are, in fact, undone by the death of a child, the absence of a parent, or more often, the presence of the parents. Sibling rivalry is a, a problem as well. Affection and antagonism are sometimes barely distinguishable in these stories. But most of Monique Schwitter's characters do f have coping strategies that help them survive or even prevail. One of her characters sums it up uh, rather neatly. As always, reality is less beautiful and fiction is my elixir for survival. Uh, these stories are available in translation by Elenid Gromich, published by Parthian Books. Unfortunately, they didn't get here in time, but uh, please uh, look for them on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles, actually not Amazon, but Barnes and Nobles, or ask your local independent bookstore to order them, even better. Okay. Thank you very much, Tassin. Yeah, um, I got a cold and I got it here, but um, I love to be here and I want to say thank you for inviting me. It's very, I'm grateful and it's, yeah. <laughs> ich habe oft erzählt, mein Vater sei tot, aber das stimmt nicht. Mein Vater trinkt, jeder Mensch trinkt, du musst viel trinken, ist der häufigste Rat, den man mir gibt. Mein Vater trinkt viel, aber nichts Heißes. Er verabscheut heiße Getränke. Er trinkt Milch, wenn er Durst hat und Weinbrand, wenn nicht. I'm sorry. So, because of the age. <lacht> Morgens nach dem Duschen zieht er sich einen Anzug an, dann trinkt er eine Tasse Milch und geht zur Arbeit. Samstags bleibt er da und setzt sich im Anzug in seinen Ledersessel. Mittags trinkt er einen Weinbrand. Dann sagt er, ich muss noch mal ins Büro. Meistens bleibt ein Stuhl beim Abendessen frei, nicht nur samstags. Er kommt spät abends, er kommt spät nachts im Taxi nach Hause. Ich wache auf. Ich höre dumpfe Schläge. Jemand klopft mit einem Hammer auf den Teppichboden. Ich liege und horche. Nein, es sind meine Eltern. Sie kämpfen. Ich weiß, wie das aussieht. Ab und zu höre ich ihre unterdrückten Schreie. Ich bleibe liegen. Meine Schwester hat mir beigebracht, wenn man ganz still verharrt und leise »Ich bin bereit« murmelt, packt einen der Tod, sticht zu und lässt sein Gift eindringen, das sich blitzschnell ausbreitet und einen erstarren lässt. Sie habe es schon oft ausprobiert, beim Verstecken spielen und wenn sie in der Schule nicht aufgerufen werden wolle. Es habe immer geklappt, sie sei dann unsichtbar. Man dürfe nur nicht vergessen, rechtzeitig »Lass mich los« zu rufen. »Ich bin bereit«, flüstere ich. »Und schon lähmt es mich, das Gift. Es funktioniert.« Ich war mir oft sicher, mein Vater sei tot und dann tauchte er an einer unerwarteten Ecke auf. Einmal sind wir in der Straßenbahn aneinander vorbeigefahren. An einer Haltestelle erblickte ich ihn in der Bahn, die in entgegengesetzter Richtung unterwegs war. Menschen stiegen aus und ein. Er blickte stumpf vor sich hin, er schien nichts wahrzunehmen. Ich starrte ihn durch die beiden Scheiben an und überlegte kurz, die Bahn zu wechseln. Er sah jäh auf und in meine Richtung. 
Meine Straßenbahn setzte sich in Bewegung. Ich drehte mich auf dem Sitz nach ihm um, aber alles, was ich sehen konnte, war sein Nacken. Der Kopf war nach vorne gekippt. Es sah aus, als sei er ganz plötzlich eingenickt oder gestorben. Whether this story is true or not, I don't know. But I've heard it so often I can't imagine it's not. On his 35th birthday, the 13th of November 1976, my father visited for the first time an illegal casino, which was periodically set up in the hall of a long-established, well-respected hotel. He approached a table, had them explain the rules, didn't quite understand them, and started gambling. He stumbled into the rainy dawn of Sunday morning, clutching to his heart the thickest wallet he himself had ever seen. He'd won all night long without having understood the rules in much detail. He wasn't drunk enough to go home yet. The taxi driver pretended not to understand him. Write the address on this piece of paper, he demanded. Late night bar, jotted my father down. I don't know it, answered the taxi driver. Come on, I'll take you home. Where do you live? My father took out the wallet out of his jacket, opened it and offered a few notes to the taxi driver. Late night bar, he repeated. It wasn't a bar, but a brothel, though it had an area where drinks were served. There were no other guests, at least none who were drinking. My father ordered a brandy. When he came to, completely soaking wet, he was lying on the sidewalk in front of the establishment, without his coat, without his watch, without his wallet. His glasses were broken and half hung on his nose, half on his ear. He had a few bloody bruises around his stomach and ribs as well as his face. He told us the story repeatedly as a warning, I assume, against alcohol, gambling, and the red light district. But it wasn't at all effective, either for us children who found it more exciting, more adventurous than Robinson Crusoe, and who loved to hear it again and again and to ask about every detail. Nor for my father, who went on drinking, gambling, and whoring. He came back by taxi in the early mornings, often badly beaten, injured, tattered, bruised, and bleeding, lay down in the bed next to my sister because he knew that my mother, out of concern for the sleeping child, wouldn't interrogate him there. Got up in the early morning, showered, put on a fresh shirt, a dry clean suit, sucked a eucalyptus mint to hide the smell of alcohol on his breath, and told us the story of his 35th birthday, which had happened many years ago. Although... It occurs to me just now that my sister was never present when my father told the story. She hates my father. She doesn't want him to lie next to her in the bed. My father stinks and he snores. My big sister wakes up and tries to push him out, but my father is heavy and his sleep is as deep as an abyss. I often dreamt that my father was dead. I woke up screaming because of it according to witnesses.